Good afternoon. Let's get started. Our speaker next week will be David Livingston, who is with the Energy and Climate Program for the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He will talk to us on oil climate index, greenhouse gas emissions along the oil production supply chain. So basically, he will look at, they have developed a methodology for quantifying emissions all along from upstream all the way to downstream, looking at how much emissions are produced at every single step. Uh, and then it, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting tool that can inform a range of uh, policy uh, policies also. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Richie Yahuja. Richie is the Regional Director for Asia for the Environmental Defense Fund. He is based locally in Austin. They have offices uh, in downtown. So it's a great resource. Uh, we benefit a lot from interactions with EDF uh, in many of our programs. Uh, Richie is an expert in international... Hello? Great. Uh, this is much better. Richie is an expert in international business, and he really focuses on exploring innovative ideas for promoting low carbon development and promoting best practices around those ideas. But in particular, he focuses a lot on climate change finance and works on developing innovative mechanisms to think about flows of funds from developed to developing countries. As, as many of you might know, this is a major, major uh, area of uh, policy and global action, which is how do technologies and funds to uh, fund those technologies actually flow uh, from developed to developing countries. And so Richie works in that area uh, in order to ensure the design of these systems and also climate change uh, finance effectiveness. He is an expert on international business, as I said. He has an MBA in international business from Thunderbird School of Management and uh, a degree in business communications from St. Javier's College, Calcutta, which happens to be the city where I grew up. It's such a pleasure to have you here, Richie. Thank you. Is that clear? Good. Hi. Uh, thank you, Varun. Uh, really appreciate this. And thank you all of you for uh, coming in on a nice cold day to the university. Um, so before I begin, first of all, uh, I was pretty surprised when Varun asked me to talk about low carbon rural development, having been at some of these sessions before, which are pretty data intensive, and you guys talk about stuff that I don't fully even understand at times about smart grids and carbon capture and storage and, and what have you. So I was like, okay, low carbon rural development is, is all about energy still, uh, but it's a different look at energy. It's a broader sweep on energy. And uh, so without further ado, let's just sort of dive into this. So as Varun said, I'm from EDF, Environmental Defense Fund. So necessarily, my focus is on climate change as well as I look at energy systems and development systems across uh, in Asia. Uh, so here's sort of some starting points. So what we're going to do is sort of, I'll give you some starting points, and we'll sort of dig into a little bit about India, which is where our focus is going to be. And I'll share a case study on how we implement some of these programs, and then try and connect it back up to sort of how the government can, you know, how can government replicate these processes, or what are the challenges, governance issues, and leave it at that. So here's uh, some interesting numbers. Uh, so when we talk about energy, I just don't talk about electrons. I also talk about cooking energy, lighting energy. Uh, so here's, when you, when you look at this space, you're talking about some pretty significant part of the world that does not have much access to uh, cooking energy or lighting. I mean, I just take India, for example, or South Asia, you've got nearly 900 million people without access to clean cooking facilities, which can mean gas or electric cooking systems, and about three, 400 million people without access to energy, and even more without access to quality energy. Similarly, you've got some pretty huge numbers out of sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, so coming back here, so if you look at this, here's an interesting slide again. So why we focus on India? It's, to me, India is a micro, this space, there's more people living in that circle than that live outside of it. So, so when I look at that space, uh, particularly in India, which is so diverse, to me, India is a microcosm of the world or the developing world. It's the only country I know where people from the north can't speak to the people in, from the south or east for people from the East can't speak to the people of the West. There's too many languages, too much diversity. And it's really interesting about how that operates in that noise. So, and, and again, so if all these people that we're talking about without good access to good cooking, access to energy, these people are going to take choices coming up over the next decade or two. And those choices matter. 
We do have a problem with climate change. So energy systems, if you look at uh, BAU, all these countries and these particularly the big developing countries like India, China, their projections are going through the roof. And uh, so all those choices are going to help turn that curve, turn that trajectory around. So that matters. And then the question becomes, you know, how do you make those choices? How do you make them viable? How do you make them scalable? Uh, you know, they have to be economically viable and have to serve the national interest. It's not just about, oh, climate change is a problem, we need to solve it. It has to also serve the national interest of those places, of those individual interests, of those people who are taking those choices. So here's India. Uh, just let's have a quick look at India. It's uh, one point two odd billion people uh, per capita GDP around $1,500. Uh, growth rate depends on which year you ask. Last year 5%, this year maybe 7 next year maybe 8 But it's there, uh, reasonable inflation, food inflation is there. But interesting part, 70% of the population is in, 60% uh, or nearly 70% is in 640,000 villages and 31% 30, odd in towns or cities. Now, if I take the same country and think about the same country in 2040 or 2035, uh, what's fascinating is the population goes up. It goes up to 1.5 billion people. 50% uh, of them are going to be living in villages and 50% of them in cities, ballpark. Now, 50% in villages means that the population in villages is actually going to increase. The rural population is going to increase in absolute terms between now and 2040, even though the urbanization rates are going up. And that's, uh, that has ramifications when I talk about choices on uh, energy systems in the rural sector. And if you look at that country again uh, and try and imagine it at 7 8% growth rate, 2040, uh, 2035, 70% of the building stock in that country or 70% of that country doesn't exist today. It's going to be built over the next 15 years. So you're looking at some tremendous growth rates and, and building and energy intensive systems coming in. Uh, it's also a young country. Average age is uh, 24 years. Uh, you know, it's the only country where the working population will keep increasing for the next 25 years. There's 647 million people who are below 25 years old. So uh, again, lots of dynamic stuff going on in the country on that front. And as I was talking to you earlier, if you think about transitions, here's an example of a transition on what's going on within the country. Growth is happening. It's a reality. I mean, the countries are beginning to figure out the growth formula, so that means energy, system, you know, energy usage is going to go up. Energy is obviously intrinsically linked to the idea of getting that growth going. Uh, just between 2013 and 2017, you're looking at about 112 million people coming out of the deprived India part of that pyramid. So the population distribution is changing. The income distribution is changing. So people are moving up that pyramid slowly. China has been a great example. He's shown you over the last 20 years how rapidly that change can happen. And uh, you're beginning to see that in India. And if it can stay consistent on its growth path, uh, certainly we're looking at some very interesting times ahead. But let's go back to what I mentioned. Uh, there is, so we talked about cooking energy and lighting energy. There are some major gaps. Uh, there's about 250 million households in India, 170 odd million in rural sector. And as you can see, huge, huge numbers here. So I'm not going to go down that table, but huge numbers relying on uh, firewood and crop residue and cow dung and uh, sort of non-clean sources for cooking systems and huge numbers, again, for non-clean systems for lighting system. And, uh, and here you go. This is what it looks like if you project out to 2040 in terms of energy use. Again, India remains very small. India consumes, the average Indian consumes about a tenth of the energy that the American, average American does. And it's expected to grow, but uh, we're not looking at the same thing as what we're seeing in other parts in China, for example. So just to put it in context, uh, you know, there's 310 million people, the equivalent population of the United States without electricity in India. Uh, it's about, as you can see, a huge number, again, 760 million odd without refrigeration. And they, they're going to want all these things. They're going to want refrigeration. They're going to want electricity, improved cooking systems. Uh, that's about 820 million people. And this is just a recent number from the IEA. So what does India want based on all this? You know, what India wants is national interest. Again, it's inclusive economic growth. They want to lift people out of poverty. And they want to do it as rapidly as possible and totally understandable in the next couple of decades. The question is, can they do it 
without a significant rise in per capita greenhouse gas emissions. Obviously, the emissions are going to go up, but the question is, can we avoid a lot of those emissions while still going up in terms of total emissions? Nobody's asking for those emissions to come down right now. So, but there's an associated challenge with that. So we don't, you know, there's a memory globally or in countries and systems, and you know, we know how to make and finance utility scale solar. Uh, utility scale coal, for example, or hydro. I mean, the banking system understands it, the investors understand it, the producers understand it. There's a memory there that exists, and uh, we're sort of looking, living in exciting times right now where a lot of change is going on in the energy landscape, and, and you all are here based on that change. You're all excited about it, I hope. So, so you know, the worry is what are the choices, or the thought here is, here is not the worry, but more the thought is what are the ch challenges, I mean, the choices that India is going to make over the next five, six, seven, ten years? Because you're looking at, if you're looking at energy system, you're looking at infrastructure lock-in. If I want to create a coal-fired power plant today, uh, 10 years from now, I start talking about it today. It takes seven years to build one in India. And I start creating the financing and having the conversations and acquiring land and everything else. So those choices are going to matter a lot. And uh, you can't just, you know, one can't just go in and say, don't do this. Obviously, the imperative is inclusive growth it's important to demonstrate how to do something different and better and how does it serve and making the argument for national self-interest. Now, if I look at that, there's some critical components, right? Uh, if you're looking at avoiding emissions, there's power generation infrastructure, this is what one, one of the things I mentioned, and that's a full conversation in itself. You could have three or four classes on this or you know, really dig into that detail. There's the issue of inclusive growth and rural development, which is taking these seven, eight hundred million people uh, living in the rural sector and helping deliver energy and better cooking systems to this sector. Uh, again, doing it the right way and improving growth. There's a question around saving, uh, reducing emissions around built environment and industry. There's going to be a lot of growth in that sector. And to get it all done, you need good governance structures in place. So here today, I'm actually just going to focus on this little bit. So we're going to talk about rural development. Uh, it's very different from, as I said, from looking at pure energy systems or grids or anything on those lines. It's a much broader conversation, but I think, or I hope, you'll find it interesting and some ideas here. And not just rural development, we'll actually talk about low-carbon rural development. So, you know, what basically drove us on this, the so EDF works with partners in India on this to try and figure this out. How do we deliver this change on the ground? And, uh, and low-carbon rural development is just an idea. I mean, like, we did not know, you know, you can't just, the idea was, you know, I, couldn't, I didn't even understand it myself. What does it mean? How do you make it viable? You know, what can you deliver? I mean, can it be done economically? Can it be taken to scale? So, so what does it mean? So if you look at a landscape, just think about it very simply, a house that sits in a little community which interacts with the farm around it, which interacts with the forest around it. And there's energy flowing within the, that landscape, a broad definition of energy. There's firewood coming in, uh, dung being burnt, uh, biomass being burnt, energy systems being applied on the farms, energy systems coming in from outside and from, from the point of view of uh, kerosene being brought in for lighting or diesel being brought up for diesel gensets for farms. So mapping all that out and figuring it and out and then sort of figuring out how to promote resource use efficiency and move to a low carbon development or low carbon pathway in this landscape is what sort of we did. And, uh, and we identified a few interventions. So when you think of a basic farm, I mean, you're talking about an average farmer with one or two acres of land, three acres of land, uh, pretty hard work, intensive work. Uh, but is there room to grow in that space? Is there a way to actually change systems and promote resource use efficiency in a way that not only delivers gain to the farmer, but also reduces emissions? So think about it, if, you bring, if you're in the central part of India, you're lifting water up from 800 feet down to using a diesel genset to water your land. Uh, can we figure out how to reduce the water usage and also change the systems that are used to bring that water up? Are you applying nitrogen? Uh, as this country grows, uh, nitrogen use is going up in a big way. Is there a way to fix that nitrogen application so that you can improve yields without having major environmental damages? And in the process, can you reduce emissions? So, so that's what we found, that you, uh, you can actually reduce emissions, you can improve profitability, you can uh, deliver on food security, 
both at the farm level and aggregate at the national level. And, uh, and environmental gain, gains overall include mitigation and adaptation. This is how the world cooks, generally. It's, it's usually a clay uh, a structure that's built in, or you use bricks to make it, as the case may be. We call it the chula. Uh, you burn firewood in it. Efficiency of burning is about 8, 9, 10, 11 percent. Uh, and it has major health hazards, indoor air qualities. The issues are there. Suspended particulate matter issues are there. Uh, which, which leads to emphysema and a whole bunch of other impacts. And on top of that, the people have to go out and walk for miles to collect firewood. A simple system, you know, not everybody, uh, you know, you can move to a more efficient cook stove and just double efficiency right there and reduce half the use of firewood for the same household and improve quality of life. If you have a few of these cows uh, and a stall to host them, you can actually give them, uh, find ways to deliver gas to the people uh, using biogas units. And here you're saving about 1.5 to 3 tons per household per year. Uh, again, you're reducing indoor air pollution, improving health. Not only that, but you're changing the way the household eats, the nutrition balance changes. We actually did a great study with Columbia recently where we were working on the ground and they did a randomized control trial to figure this out. And the dietary habits changed within the household. The nutrition balance went out of the window. It was really nice to see the amount of and the variety of food being consumed in those households. So we're sort of digging in more into that. And it frees up a lot of time, so household incomes go up, so there's some major income effects. You all are comfortable and probably know about this story here. Uh, again, uh, bringing in five LED lamps in a house and uh, putting in a small solar panel on top can change the world. Uh, it can also reduce about 0 0.3 tons per, cap per year of emissions. But all this takes money. You can't just, you know, you can say, yeah, it's my wish list. I want to deliver a biogas unit. A biogas unit costs 12,000 rupees, $220, or up to $300. A household that's earning $1,000, $300 is a major, major issue. How do you get that to that household? Uh, same thing with a solar panel. There's, there's money involved here. You know, that's the stuff you grapple with. Uh, how do you deliver this in a way that more and more people can take this up and it's not just a ground-based program? So, so that's where the case study comes in. We sort of try to figure out how this can be done on the ground. And as we go through this, uh, I'd like you all to actually sort of take this and think about, we'll try and make the linkages with uh, governance and policy, what the policy implications are of these particular approaches. So how do you go about delivering change? I mean, like in the end, you need institutional capacity. It can be local, national. You need really boots on the ground. You need people to be able to go out and talk to the folks. Uh, you need good data, uh, often lacking in developing worlds, baseline information. I mean, like anything you want to do has to be based on good information. If not, then you end up with poor planning. So that's important. Uh, you need also appropriate uh, interventions. You don't want something that's not going to deliver what locals need. Uh, something you, you overreach, you're not going to get there. If you underreach, it doesn't get you there. So you have to get it, get it just right. And what the people are looking for is, you know, they're not looking for just energy. They're looking for growth, poverty alleviation, risk management, health impacts, education, all the development things, as I said, India is concerned about, which is development or developing world is concerned about. And you need money to do all this. And the money can come from many places. It can come from households. I mean, while you're a poor household, you can still put in equity. Uh, if you need to do a biogas program, you can either put labor to dig the pit or you can go out and uh, put some money, like 1,000, 2,000 rupees as investment. There's national resources, so you can get it through budgetary line items. You know, India is, or any other country, for example, in the developing world is in the business of development. A lot of the expenditure is towards these issues. Uh, there's debt, so microloans, uh, and fortunately in India, good financial systems exist to try and deliver some of this. There's overseas development assistance and uh, carbon markets, for example. And then, of course, you want to be able to, you know, this is where we fail often, which is the last mile issue. It's great to have a great idea. And then to try and deliver it, uh, the last mile, uh, that's a lot of hard work. Uh, and you want to do that right. And, uh, and you want to do a lot of transparency and accountability around it. So this is kind of where we work. Uh, we're in, in south, southern and eastern parts of India now. Uh, and the work has grown, so I'm sort of giving you a bit more of a historical perspective here, uh, going back to four years. 
So here, uh, again, we sort of became a part of or helped found and are a very active player in a network. We, helped, we said, well, we can't do it. We need boots on the ground. So we tied up with local participants. And I'm not just saying NGOs. I'm talking about funding agencies, bankers, the academic community. So we created a pretty wide coalition. And, uh, and that has, again, implications, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, business leaders, so trying to figure out how do you deliver change on the ground, and all these parties are interested in delivering change on the ground. Uh, so we benefited from this rich information exchange and benefited from peer-to-peer -peer interactions, and it's a lot easier for one NGO to convince another once they get convinced on an idea or a banker to convince another banker than me as EDF or anybody else to go in and talk to a banker and say this is a great idea. So peer-to-peer -peer always helps. And the approach has been basically uh, get some good baseline data going just to figure out what intervention you can make. So to capture the baseline data, we used folks, uh, the NGO community that we tied up with, the people who've been there for decades. And before we'd go to them earlier when I met them and we talked to them, uh, we'd say, look, you work in this area. Uh, tell me how many villages do you work in and how many uh, households are for example, widow-led and people living in semi-permanent structures. That's a data point they didn't have. But they are in the business of development. They could give you a lot of anecdotal evidence on uh, what they've been doing and how growth is happening. But sort of making it more rigorous uh, and creating that in, uh, decision matrix really helps. So we sort of went out and did census-level surveys uh, across the community, across the landscape. Uh, looking, trying to look at basically whether the household's electrified, what's the, what's the quality of the house, how many bulbs they have, do they have a place to build a biogas unit, what's the income of the households, et cetera, et cetera, stuff that the countries do now. So, so that was really what we used to figure out how to go in and what intervention to deliver. The challenge was, you know, you may ask, why not just airdrop an intervention? Why not bring in a single intervention, say biogas only? Why are you trying to do all this? Regardless of which intervention I do, I've got to do all of this anyways. And uh, if you focus only on one, then I can't deliver interventions to more than you know, X number of households in a community. The more households you can attract, the lower your transaction cost per household. So that's what sort of we were looking at. So we captured all of this demographic data. We uh, worked to figure out uh, farm boundaries, et cetera. And then we implemented the program. So we measured the change. Uh, we measured, you know, it's an employment generation program. We measured how many new people are getting employed in the process, which the country is interested in. If you have 600 million people who are coming into the workforce over time, uh, we measured impacts on the farms uh, in terms of yield effects, income effects, em uh, environmental effects. There was, we set up systems of monitoring and reporting, which again had a whole bunch of associated benefits uh, from the point of view of, uh, you know, the farmers could go back and look back and reflect on what happened last year and the year before and adjust. And that really helps. It's like, you know, out here it's normal habit to keep a farmer's almanac. But, uh, but this was all very new, and helping do the accounts really helped. So a lot of monitoring and reporting, in-depth fertilizer usage, energy usage on farms, water usage on farms, figuring out exactly what the reductions are. Again, to make the big long-term policy case. And as I said, we measured all these results. And, and we measured emissions on the ground. So we measured uh, you know, farming system emissions. We employed local folks. We have employed scientists. We have now five gas chromatographs in, in the field. And for the last three years, we've been measuring emissions not only from uh, farms, but also from other energy systems like biogas, et cetera, to figure out really what the full impacts are on the climate change side as well. And then in the end, we said, all right, we've got to finance this. So we financed this because we were not working with government initially. The partners were working directly with the constituents. We financed this through forward transactions uh, in terms of carbon transactions. So we said, we're going to build 5,000 biogas units or install solar lighting in 15,000 households. Uh, the future carbon if, uh, em emission reduction unit, CER stream, looks like you project it. And then we sort of go to an investor and say, you give us the money up front and we'll repay you in this asset class, which is the CERs. And we did this because basically the world is putting a price on carbon. It is happening, uh, like it or not. It's, you know, it's wonderful. You're seeing this across the board. Even in India, there's a, 
actually a tax on coal, uh, about I think it's 100 rupees, which is a dollar 80 per ton of coal, coal produced domestically and or imported. And that money goes towards uh, sort of improving uh, over green technologies and uh, low carbon development. But uh, if you look at all these, uh, the, the global map here, that's about nearly 40% of global emissions that are under a cap. And that's a big number. And, uh, and in terms of the volume, it's expected to grow. So we wanted to take that opportunity. And the other side is within the country, uh, businesses want to show leadership. So one of the ways we did this was India's largest airline uh, said that, hey, uh, we want to really try and offer offset programs to our customers. So they tied up with us, uh, with the network. We don't, EDF doesn't take any money from corporate, so it wasn't any, no, no funds flow to us. But they tied up and uh, they basically, every time you book a ticket, the 100 rupees gets charged uh, on a pre-checked box and uh, the money flows to the projects for the capital expenditures. And we have, what we found out in the process is that the transaction costs have stayed below 10%. Of every dollar that goes in, only 10, 10 cents is used for uh, administration expenses and other transaction costs. So when you look at it, defining success to us has meant you know, maintain yields, uh, ensure that there's developmental impacts, measure it all. If you can't measure it, you can't convince the people that it's real. Uh, and energy delivered and energy saved. Uh, so energy, in, in, and in the process, emissions reduced or avoided. And this sort of gives you that whole food security, which is a national interest issue, uh, water security, which is an international interest issue. It gives you development, and it gives you energy access and energy security. Uh, a reasonable argument when, you come, when it comes to talking to policymakers about taking on these kind of investments. And here's a snapshot of what's sort of gone on the, over the last six years. Uh, you know, we've kind of worked with nearly 370,000 families. Estimated emission reductions are about a million tons a year, uh, which, is, which is pretty huge. Uh, 40 projects in hand and growing. And we've sort of now moved beyond this. We're not, so we've done the policy case now, and we're trying to now work with the government to try and do this across landscapes and sub-national jurisdictions. So we're trying to take two, three, four districts in India and say, let's have a, you know, it's, this is a pretty big sandbox, but can we have a saturation approach? Can we now use the government horsepower to drive this change? In the end, NGOs can only sort of demonstrate it's not a job of an NGO or private sector to build a school within walking distance of every kid in India. It's the job of the government to do it. So, so the government really has to come in and make magic here. So, you know, but the, as I said earlier, so if you take this whole project and we take a moment to reflect, uh, to move to these jurisdictional approaches, we've got the same hurdles. I mean, development, developing country governance challenges. I mean, it's a huge bureaucracy. There's, there are issues of corruption, uh, performance of institutions. The rule of law is, you know, an issue. It's improving. And often, you know, planning can be based on poor information. Uh, we do have last mile problems. India's got a lot of good plans, but often the last mile problems create some problems in terms of delivery. And there's lack of transparency and accountability. But uh, looking back at, again, the project that we've had and the, what I described to you all, it's also very exciting right now what's going on. Change is afoot. Uh, information technology is just something that's going to really drive some of this change. Is the use is accelerating rapidly. India is building a big GIS layer for the whole country. Uh, they've got unique ID cards. Uh, financial inclusion and banking, I think in the last three, four months alone, they've brought in about 20, 30 million rural households into the banking sector. Uh, they're creating soil health cards. Labs are being set up in every district. So a lot of it is afoot. And all these, and this is all happening because costs are dropping because of IT. Uh, data collection and availability is improving rapidly right across the board. You are seeing uh, various mechanisms, being, IT mechanisms being used to connect with the government. Uh, right to transparency has gone up. They've, passed and write to Information Act, where you can write to the government now and ask for information, and they're required to respond within the month. And, uh, and business sector is worried. Uh, business sector wants inclusion. Uh, business sector is also, this is the only country in the world right now, I think, where the business sector accepted very quietly last year a 2% tax, basically, a 3% tax. Uh, there was a law that was passed that said, if you average your last three years' profits, 2% of those profits have to go towards uh, inclusive growth. 
and they define environment and a whole bunch of other parameters as inclusive growth. And the business very quietly took it. Not many other places in the world I know which would give away 2% of their profit uh, without, without a whimper. It was, yes, absolutely, we need to see inclusive growth. You need to bring everybody else along. So that's, again, opened up this whole pool of 4 or $5 billion to try and access to promote these kind of things. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of experiments going on in governance. Uh, there's decentralization of governance going on at the local village level, uh, more and more inclusion of women. Uh, I think by law there's about 30%, 33% requirement of women as elected leaders. It's changed. It by now already 40% of elected leaders in the village level are women. And that's also changing behavior and bringing in new faces and new people into the governance structures. As I said, it's a very young country, and, and you're going to see that again at the national level as well. The face of the parliament is changing. The recent government shows you that. And that brings in, injects new thinking into the process. So this is, to me, very, very exciting. So, you know, the growth has happened in spite of poor governance. Uh, but uh, role, what needs to happen is, uh, on, just like we did, we brought in everybody. When you think about it, the first slide I showed you about the network. Uh, you really need to bring everybody else along. You, know, you can't just sit down and make a decision in a silo. Uh, you need market forces, entrepreneurs, bankers, uh, create PPP systems, and new models of delivery of change. Uh, and information technology needs to be leveraged. So when I think about this work, uh, I think about How much time do I have, by the way? OK. So when I think about this work, uh, I think about you know, the, all this stuff that we've done, the data collection, et cetera, to me, that's an operating system. That's a decision matrix. So if in IT tech terminology, I think of that as, you know, the solar panels, the biogas units, uh, cook stoves, financial inclusion, anything else you want to do on top is an application. But you need to know how to deliver it. You need to have to have an operating system on which all that can sit. You know, you can, you can be a manufacturer of solar panels today, but you don't know how to get to your market. And creating that space, creating that system really helps. And I think uh, it's important that we take that into account. And the other pieces, of course, if you look at rural landscapes, and this applies, again, across the board. It's not just India. I'm talking very generally here. Uh, they're complex. And, uh, and we want to disaggregate the complexity, yes, but we also want to em embrace it. Uh, trying to go in and deliver a single, single bullet, silver bullet solution is not always the best option. I think having, embracing that complexity creates more resilient solutions over the long term. Uh, we, I touched upon this earlier. I think uh, having that participatory approach is extremely important. And, and, you know, in this process, it is possible to have a low carbon development uh, program or create that pathway. Uh, we need more emissions data from across the four, from not only just from France, from households. And we need to recognize that whatever is being done is not permanent. Change is going to happen. I mean, you, know, you can move from firewood to a more efficient cook stove to a biogas to an LPG, or you can take the leap straight from a firewood to an LPG. But again, things will still change. And, uh, and I think I worry about place things when people tell me that, uh, oh, no, solar programs or these kind of programs cannot happen. I mean, if I look back at my own, you know, just let's look over the last decade. 10, 12, 15 years. 10, 15 years ago, if you'd asked me that there'd be 700 million cell phones in India and moving to smartphones, I would have laughed at you. It would have been, it's not imaginable. Uh, today, everybody's talking about PDAs, and uh, there's new technologies to figure out what the yield projections are going to be uh, by taking pictures of uh, crop, crops during different growth periods and uh, sending that data back and running the, the models. And you can really predict I mean, what the future yields are going to be within, with 80 90% confidence, which is incredible. So, so all these so resources are going to be available uh, on the ground. But, uh, but we need to keep that fundamental. So there we go. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Ran through that pretty hard and fast because uh, I figured there'd be more Questions from you all. Uh, it's a very different approach to energy here. Yeah. Uh, so, how much? Just... There you go. All right. 
Hey, how you doing? My name is Brian Davis. I'm a um, fifth year uh, government major here. Um, how much of a role do you see foreign capital governments and NGOs playing a role in the development that you were talking about today? Uh, again, there's no, I would say context matters here. So, you know, foreign capital in some countries, yes. In some countries, less. Uh, what do you mean by foreign capital? If it's overseas development assistance, it can be, you have to blend an instrument together to make this work. You know, so let's just take, for example, uh, if a lot of you are familiar with solar power, for example, decentralized solar. There are challenges with it. You need to reduce the cost of capital. You need to ag aggregate. You need to help manage risk. So foreign capital can come into play in some of that. Uh, you can bring in ODA. You can bring in some money. Maybe there's a green climate fund being set up. There's, you know, there's big resources maybe available there. Uh, India has a pretty deep and wide financial markets. There's money that can be raised internally. So I, I, there's not a single answer saying that this is going to be a huge role or a small role. Uh, it may play a bigger role in a LDC, a least developing country, developed countries in Africa, for example. But uh, in India, I don't know how big a role you know, foreign capital is going to play. I mean, right now, there's the, the country is fairly flush with foreign capital. Hi, I'm a first year in chemical engineering. Um, Sorry? I'm a first year in chemical engineering. I was sort of wondering on some of the more social aspects of your solution that you're proposing, um, how does this directly affect um, the caste issues in India and gender roles? <coughs> Excuse me. Good question. Uh, so again, it's about development, right? So in this case, for example, what the NGOs decided, not me, the partners, uh, they work and they wanted to deal with gender issues. Now, classically in India, uh, if you're working in the kitchen, you are the youngest daughter-in-law who is put to work in the kitchen. That's just culturally the right, you know, that's what happens. That's the cultural norm. Am I correct? So, and they have very little, you know, the mother-in-law drives the train here or the, the older daughter-in-laws do. <coughs> so what some of these NGOs have done is basically they've insisted that when you open this, create this biogas unit, uh, after three or four years, or during, during the first year itself, there's an income stream because you're reducing emissions, so you're selling those emissions in the market. Excuse me. I've been painting my house, so I've been breathing in <laughs> fumes. Uh, so what the NGOs have done is actually open bank accounts for the youngest daughter-in-law of the house. And that changes the dynamic. So if you're earning $1,000 a year in the household, opening up an account and then having 50 to $70 a year at $15 a year per ton, go to that woman, significant. It changes the dynamic, changes the way she behaves, and bring that, brings that whole issue forward. So just a simple example. And similarly with cost as well. NGOs can decide you know, where they want to start rolling out the program first. It doesn't have to start with a higher cost. You can start with a lower cost, and that itself is a signal. Richie, I'll allow you to catch a breath. No, no, that's You're okay. getting some water for you. No, <clears throat> but I ask my question. Very, very interesting presentation. Oh, and I especially like the idea of the operating system. Can you talk a little bit more about... The, you did discuss the components, but you know, just from the perspective of an operating system, what the components are, which parts of those components are readily replicable in other problem areas or other applications, and which parts you think will need to have more of an adaptation as this model tries to get replicated. So you know, the, how much of this is you can take and just transport by different application or problem area, and what what else might mm -hmm. need to kind of mm -hmm. adapt. Okay. So look, the operating system is, again, okay, great question, and I'm glad you brought it up. The operating system is basically the decision matrix. From us, from we built one that's pretty extensive because that's what our constituents, our partners were interested in. Thank you. I don't need 200 data points to define which house should get a biogas unit, for example. All I need to know is the breed of cattle, whether there's a stall outside where to house the cattle, is there a space outside the kitchen somewhere to build a biogas unit or a community biogas unit, and how far is it from the kitchen? That's it. I don't need more than that. Uh, and do they intend to keep the cows or not? 
uh, but more broadly, you know, these, the, the NGOs are interested in broader information sets to do a lot more because they're interested in development. So the country itself is going through this process, the Census Survey of India, the Economic Survey of India, collects a lot of this information. Often, the question is how real it is and can we trust it? And, then, and it's beginning to happen. It's more digitized in the way it's being done and what have you. So you can use those kind of pieces of information and as you build the GIS layers and know exactly which, village, which villages, access increases, you can figure out what can go into those places. There are pieces that are missing. Uh, you know, often people will not tell you how much they earn, so it's better to have an indication using asset base as to what the quality or the income of the households is, etc. So all that sometimes is harder to get, so sometimes you need to go out and create that layer. Uh, but I think the information overall now, more, more and more is going to be available over the next decade. So, and that's key. I mean, the question is, is it available? And then the next question is, is it going to be used? And how will it be used? So, so this is where we come in. So we're saying that this is a way to look at this and, uh, and use this information. Or here are the elements of the information that can help you define which, uh, which intervention to make. So when we go into a district to try and drive this change, the government lives in silos, right? So the farm, there's a Ministry of Agriculture, there's a Ministry of Rural Development, there's a Ministry of Renewable Energy, there's a Ministry of Power. Uh, and then there's different funding allocations to deliver kerosene subsidies, fertilizer subsidy, uh, deliver seeds, uh, horticulture issues, I mean, just the works. And getting those guys to talk to each other and share information and create a single data set is a big deal. So that's where sort of where I think making that happen is the key. And, and more you digitize it, and the more you make it transparent the information, the, more, the easier it is to get it done. Because then bottom up, people ask for it, and entrepreneurs can step up and use the same information as well and drive change upstream. Richie, I had a question. Um, mm -hmm. Just follow up on that. Do, um, what education structure or uh, policies have worked on the ground have you guys had a, a learning curve as far as uh, teaching people how to install and use these uh, biomass or whatever units uh, efficiently? So, good question. Thank you. Um, there's some good literature out there that says you know that you put in a solar panel and it's only going to last that long before it's not working because after sale support is not there, or you put in a biogas system, and I've, even India is replete with examples where biogas systems have gone in through tender processes through the government, and they may, a lot of them are not working today because there's no after sales support and training on how to keep those maintained. Uh, the moment we linked it up with markets uh, and created that incentive to keep using the unit and having income come in as a result of the system, uh, there's a very strong incentive to keep using it. We linked it up with monitoring and reporting mechanisms. At any point in time, over the last eight, 10 years, every time we look at usage now, 98% of them are active, which is significant. That's a huge number. Uh, so, and then on, on top of that, you saw those folks building the units. So each of those units or whatever has a number and there has a person who built it living locally. So there's assignment there of, you know, that if there's anything breaks down, there's local capacity to take care of it rather than trying to get somebody in from the outside. Thank you. Hey, this is a lot of good questions for an energy class. <laughs> well, we try. <laughs> um, I was curious about land ownership and title, because uh -huh. uh, that's often a barrier to, to investment. And, right, and is. right. So if you'd clarify what the situation is in India, I'd appreciate it. Uh, so I talked about the GIS layer, right, that's happening. So they are actually, so we went out and used GPS systems to develop shape maps and I wish I had brought the KML files. We can sort of pretty much click and see the stuff on Google Earth and dive down right into the household. So we're using, you know, we've got SQL servers and data on 500,000 households that we can dive right into and see what's going on. Uh, states in India are all moving towards this creating, digitizing everything uh, in terms of own land ownership, et cetera. Right now, if I were, to, well, some states have already moved on to it. Karnataka has already done it in South India. Uh, but it's going to happen, and nine or ten are already there, but it's within the next two, three years, I think the whole country is going to be on a digital landscape on that front. 
Uh, overall, uh, you're right. The moment you have that, right now everything is based on sort of a survey of India, land survey done by the Brits when, when they were in India. And, you know, you open up this book and it has notes about there's a cadastral map and there's notes in it saying this land was owned by so-and-so, then so-and-so died, and the land from this rock to that tree belongs to so-and-so. And this. So all that needs to be digitized. It's a lot of hard work. And it's being done, and I think uh, that will open up the door. So with financial inclusion, opening a bank account and land rights, clearly defined, will open up a lot of room for getting uh, cheaper money, so to say, instead of going through the middleman. Uh, I think from what, what I can recall, what we're seeing is about the moment you have those papers uh, and a bank account, you can usually get about twenty-five to 35,000 rupees, a $500 loan pretty easily. Yep. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, I'm assuming this is the case that these programs are not successful unless, like, the expertise and the materials become local. Like, you, you have you've secured local materials or whatever to build these things. I was just wondering, how do you how do you ensure that that lasts long term? I guess in the future. So the only thing that's local in this case was the biogas unit that I'm talking about. Uh, the expertise. It's about human capital. You know. It, the, the, the more efficient cook stove is airdropped and it's, it exists. You just, you just got to make sure that it's the right kind of product that's going to be used. And you can airdrop that in. Uh, solar systems, again, you need, once you've installed it right, and you need some local capacity to maintenance, et cetera. So that can happen. The, the only big piece in this was the biogas units, which you need to have the local expertise, I think, to maintain. So if I actually projected the idea that everything is local, no. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's coming in from the outside, but there's local, what's needed is local capacity to maintain it, and that's beginning to happen a lot now. Again, think about it as a big market. I mean, these are products, and uh, companies are really interested in trying to get them out there now. Any other questions? Hi, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you covered this in your presentation, but I was wondering how these biogas units were financed uh, to begin with. Uh, and, and my second question um, was, uh, how, what kind of policies do you uh, see coming out of this and what level, uh, whether those are national policies or state policies? Um, because, uh, you know, even for example, solar pumps got a lot of attention in the recent future. Mm -hmm. It was a very heavily subsidy driven initiative. Uh -huh. But even though they're offering like 90% subsidies, you know, even the farmers cannot, are, are not even uh, able to afford the, the little bit. So what, what kind of policies do you see coming out of this? Thanks. Good, good question. So on the biogas units, as I said, they reduce about three tons of emissions a year. Costs about $220, let's just say, hypothetically, or $200 for ease of use. Uh, three tons at $16, $15 a ton. Uh, so you're talking about sort of 12 tons is all you need to really pay for 12, 13 tons. So 13 tons is basically four years of emission stream to pay for it. Typically, a carbon contract under a compliance market is for seven years. So you said, okay, fine, we've got this project document approved for the seven years. These credits are going to be viable in the carbon markets. So we sort of take the forward funding from those four years to fund these uh, units. Uh, in terms of your policies, uh, look, policies, it's, it's a, you're, you've, you've hit the nail right on the head. Uh, it's important to design, you know, certainly subsidies work. I'm not against subsidies. Subsidies, especially if they are going to address a market distortion, how subsidies are useful to get a technology going. Sometimes they need a push. Uh, there's a lot of good frameworks within India. I mean, like on at least uh, you know, solar solar pumps are expensive and they're being co-opted often by the richer farmers and not as much by the poor farmers, access-wise. Uh, but the prices are dropping. Uh, Solar panels for households and lighting, the more, that's the more expensive end of the model, right? Uh, basic lighting, that's already available. You can go and buy a basic light in the market. So these policies are going to create the impetus, uh, but I don't, you know, I, don't see, I don't see a policy framework that's 
this is, again, they are temporary fixes. In the end, you want to just use policy to bring them to tipping points. And so creating this space, creating a heavily subsidized policy to drive some of this, I think it's okay to some degree. In the end, you've got to deliver this change on the ground. Hi, again. Mm -hmm. Hello, again. <laughs> um, are there plans to scale this up? And if so, how do you plan to maintain these like key points that you've addressed? So I am not, so this is on autopilot. I am not scaling this up. It's scaling up by itself. Uh, but as I said, we want to work now across jurisdictions. So the idea is to work at the state and subnational levels and scale it up using the, the government machinery. And uh, so if you think of what we're doing as a small sandbox, uh, the idea now is to replicate it in two or three or four districts and create bigger sandboxes and learn from it. Because you know, government and the way the government operates is different from what's going on here, there's, although there's a lot of parallels. So we're going to try and replicate this over the next two years uh, across two or three districts in India. So we're talking about big numbers at, at a single go. And there's money, again, there's budgetary line items available uh, both within the government uh, structures. So you know, it, various ministries spend money on this. That's the business of the government. And there's ways to bring in money from the Green Climate Fund and other places as well. So we're looking at all options. Thank you for this water. This really helps. Uh, I was hoping you could comment on this thought. So it seems like with my knowledge of India is limited, in the, but my knowledge of the rural community in India is really poor. And so to worry about climate change with them and to get them to buy in doesn't seem like that's really their concern. Like they'd be more concerned about coming out of poverty. So how do you kind of line these up? Are they lined up? Uh, Frame of reference matters. Absolutely. I, they don't care. And they sh you know, it's not some, it's important that we help them understand climate change. The farmer actually is experiencing some of this. You know, they can't predict as well about the rains. Some of it is weather, some of it is climate change. They're seeing the intensities change, the losses change. Uh, but really, this is, as I said, it's individual interest and national interest that drives these decisions, not climate change. It just happens that climate change is a strong co-benefit. Now, you can turn around and you know, equally make the argument from my standpoint that climate change is my eight ball, and I really want to figure out how to deliver all these services based on climate change. The guy on the ground is thinking my eight ball is development and energy and improved profitability on the farm. So they're looking at that, and it's just great that climate change happens to be a core benefit. But helping them understand climate change to me is an important piece of this equation as well, because one of the last things I close with is that these changes are not permanent. So today, I imagine yourself in rural India or rural Africa or somewhere, and you're sort of working hard, and you've got this land, and you're doing land husbandry, and you're really taking care of it, resource use efficiency, the works, you're applying minimal fertilizer, and because you can't afford to apply more, you want to be careful. Tomorrow, a big highway goes right past your land, and it takes you 30 minutes now to get to your town, where, where, by, where, by, where earlier, Maybe there were no buses, and it took you six hours. Now, the moment that happens, there's a whole different level of computation that's going through your head, which is, let me apply as much fertilizer as possible. I don't want to deal with weeds, and I want to go to the town and earn a second stream of income. And that's a very rational argument. But having those conversations about climate change and understanding, creating that knowledge about resources efficiency, hopefully, is going to drive better decision making moving forward as well. So that's the theory. You don't want to leave that aside and say, it doesn't matter, you guys, this is not an issue of climate change for you. Absolutely it's not, but it is an issue that's for everybody, and it's worth talking about it. And that's how we go in. We go in and talk about it. We don't say, don't, I never say do this for climate change. I say do this because it makes sense. It makes economic sense for you as an individual. And it's the same argument for countries as well. Countries don't do this for climate change. They do it because it makes sense for the national interest. Does that make sense? All right. Any other questions? I wonder if you can expand a little bit more on that 2% tax for inclusive growth. Um, what has that been funding? What does that mean, really, inclusive growth? And has it been successful this far? 
Inclusive growth. Okay, good question. Uh, what does inclusive growth mean? So here's just an example of what it means. Uh, take last 10 years of growth in India. Seven, eight, nine percent growth rates. There have been years where you have eight percent growth rate, but the rural sector, for example, has shrunk. So there's people who are being left behind or not growing as fast as the country is growing, which creates challenges. So you want to bring everybody else along. That's the story, right? Now, why would business lean forward on that? Because there are some real issues. I mean, business operates within the community. It lives in, breathes in, and survives in a given community. And they want, I mean, like, you know, if you don't do inclusive growth, you end up, just think about it as a business. I want to grow. I want to have the benefit of cheap labor. I want to have the benefit of smart labor. If those people are not being educated, et cetera, then I'm going to be in trouble down the road. Or uh, I really want, you know, in the name of inclusive growth, I want good infrastructure, access to markets. Uh, again, it makes sense. So the business, I think, in India was really keen. I mean, there's a real desire within the business community to figure this out. Uh, and that's why I think they agreed that we will spend 2% of our average profit over the last three years uh, on inclusive growth. Now, the government has, mentioned, I think, mandated about eight areas where the money can go. It can go towards, you know, for example, reforestation, building basic water infrastructure. It can go towards environmental issues. It can go about gender education and a whole bunch of things. But there's some very clear aid guidelines. So an environment falls into one, into those as well. And again, I mean, you know, you, you just have to go to Delhi to figure this out. You just hang out in Delhi. It's the most polluted place on the planet today. And, uh, and a couple of hours in Delhi, and you're like, okay, yeah, inclusive growth and clean air would be great. <laughs> Hola, thank you guys. I, I hope, uh, thank you, you've been good and I hope this was useful for y'all. I'm sorry? I said we lost. Yes. <laughs>